this one is the one that the bigger greens almost always have a problem with. They always want to edit this one. The idea of affirming people's fundamental right <laughs> to self-determine ought to be a no-brainer. And yet they constantly interfere with these communities' attempts, at least on environmental matters. And remember, because they're fairly narrow at what they look at, they're only looking at the environmental errors. They're not looking at the economic development. They're not looking at the history and the culture and all that other stuff. In fact, they don't even have the time to get into that stuff because they are, after all, professionals. And so, and I'm not making the argument these rooms are all bad, 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 bad. What I'm trying to say is we need to use some discernment on where these organizations are really good. They do some things rather well. I can lobby the hell out of Congress, <laughs> right? What they do on a local level, not so good. For the most part, they, they, they never seem to get it right because their business model doesn't really lend itself to that. So I'm not going to sit here and try and argue, oh, well, we should need to get rid of all of these, uh, these uh, uh, big greens. That would be absurd. <laughs> what I'm really saying is that we're not nearly as discerning as we should be because, quite frankly, we're working at cross purposes sometimes. When it comes to this diversity and inclusion and Jedi and whatever all these acronyms that people want to use, I will say, um, I don't really care if these organizations diversify or not. I, I just want them to come clean. If they're not going to do it, I'm not going to waste my time helping them do it. I might still come to their parties on those beach fronts and those bonfires and other stuff. but. Uh, they have to roll the voice back. You don't get to be the leading voice for water if you only talk to the white people in your watershed or the black people for that matter. Welcome everyone to Biodiversity for a Livable Climate's monthly speaker series, Life Saves the Planet. It would be hard to find somebody as grounded in place and in history, apart from our indigenous neighbors, as our speaker tonight. Fred Tutman currently serves as the Patuxent Riverkeeper, an organization he founded in 2004. The Patuxent is Maryland's longest and deepest interstate waterway, and Fred's family has farmed and fished along the banks of the river since the 1700s. And the Tutman family continues to operate a farm in Prince George's County within walking distance of the river. Patuxent Riverkeeper has been pivotal in overhauling the state's approach to regulating stormwater runoff and creating new rules to assist citizens to attain standing in state courts and to bring suits against major polluters. Fred also happens to be the only African-American waterkeeper in the, in the nation, and he was a board member of the National Waterkeepers Association. The point of today's talk is that Fred brings considerable global, national, and local experience to his chosen subject for today, very important for all of us, decolonizing environmental thought. So thank you, Fred. We welcome you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. It's so hard to listen to someone else <laughs> introduce you. Like, who is that guy? So. Let me tell you, one of my favorite books as a teenager was a book by Robert Benchley called My Ten Years in a Quandary and How They Grew. That's literally the title of the book. And this talk is a little bit about a quandary that I encountered uh, after becoming a professional environmentalist, because before then I had really been an activist. And I still am an activist, but I guess I didn't really understand the frame. So to some extent, this talk, I think, is the difference, uh, talks a little bit about the difference between activism in environmentalism. It certainly does talk about decolonizing the environment because it's the only black riverkeeper in America. There's an odd phenomenon. What I find is that when I talk in front of communities that happen to be white, there's a presumption that this is validating the things that they believe in. And I'm a riverkeeper among other riverkeepers, but anywhere in the country I've gone pretty much where I'm talking to black communities, there's a presumption I'm their riverkeeper, which has changed the bar for me in terms of what I what I'm expected to be sensitized to. So the quandary has really revolved about how you have um, inclusive and uh, healthy organizations that are fully representative. And, and that's really the challenge. I guess I'm a bit of an idealist. I, I never thought it would be like a Coke commercial, everyone holding hands, the singing. But it's important to me in the work that I do as an activist in my watershed that everyone I can possibly draw to the table, I can get there. And I, so I did begin to notice early in the game um, that when we had parties, it was mostly people that were white who came by the office and that it was generally, it was, and, and I guess I should just clarify here and now, to me, ethnicity is really about worldview and culture. It's really not about skin color. 
It's about the perspective. And I do think the perspective of, of colonialism is a particular point of view. So let me do a little screen share thing. I've put together a little presentation for you here. So this is me in my quandary with, 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 with my buddy, Avery, <laughs> uh, who perhaps will be a riverkeeper someday. We don't know. He's still kind of working out what his future looks like. And the deal here is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, big greens. And to me, big greens are mass movements. They're not so necessarily connected to local communities. Their vision typically is to attract as many members and as much money as they can for whatever thing, uh, issue, or focus that they have. And I'm not a mass movement guy as much as I have had a lot of contact with them throughout the course of my adult career. Um, when I was working in television and radio, I did huge amounts of work back in the, as far back as the 1980s for the National Wildlife Federation, Sierra Club, World Wildlife Fund, Keep America Beautiful, uh, US EPA. The list is pretty long of these groups that I interacted with and worked on films about. It really wasn't until I became gradually embarrassed to be part of the media it, to the extent that we never helped anybody, that we went to all these really fantastic places, took pictures or wrote stories about people suffering, but we never really did anything about it because that really wasn't the job. And so somewhere along the line, I decided to kind of go do something else. And that something else turned out to be river keeping. So as much as I enjoyed the free travel and meeting interesting people, um, believe it or not, I know it's a strange credential, but I actually used to give jokes to Ronald Reagan back when he was president, because I used to work in the White House Office of Communications. And he was a guy who liked punchlines and would write them down, you know. Um, <laughs> but I had no social compass in those days for who I would work for. I worked for any and everybody. And, and I worked for some folks that were quite reprehensible, to be honest with you. Um, I used to play this little game in my head, you know, like, so what if the KKK offered you a, a video job? And my presumption was that would never happen. So that was a ridiculous presumption, right? That the true conflicts don't really exist was really my perspective because you're never presented with them. I now think quite differently about those things as an activist. I do believe there are lots and lots of conflicts potentially, and that it's important to disclose them. And I don't, do not believe that Big Greens always disclose their conflicts, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. As much as this talk is possible, is really about the relationship that Bigger Greens have with smaller communities, particularly with communities of color, and why that needs to change, and why decolonization is perhaps one of the best frames in order to do that. I think I mentioned that I had this epiphany about my media career and that epiphany really did happen here at this place at the Casa Rosada in Buenos Aires. I took this picture a little over a year and a half ago when I went back really for a reunion after the, what, 40 years after the Falklands War. And it was standing on this plaza uh, waiting for Costa Mendez, who was the president of Argentina at that time to come out and make a statement that a woman in our crowd, in our media, um, crowd fell to the ground and started having an epileptic seizure on the sidewalk. And nobody among us helped us, helped her, including me, because we were all afraid that if we missed the shot, that we'd all get fired or that we would be fired. And so it was really the beginning, the germination in my mind, that not only could we not help the world as journalists, we weren't even prepared to help someone at our feet suffering. <laughs> that really bugged me. And so I spent many years and then a different quandary, which was, how do I get out of this movie? <laughs> I enjoyed the technology. I enjoyed the, like I said, the travel, all that stuff, but I didn't want to be a part of the problem. I wanted to be a part of the solution. So, so eventually I went to law school and kind of changed my fate. When it comes to decolonization, I'd also lived in Africa as a boy in the sixties where I saw firsthand the, the ripple effects of colonization, you know, the, the British tourist and the, the fancy uh, pith helmet that they just got, you know, demanding uh, that, you know, boy, bring me my gin and tonic, you know, out in a luxury camping trip in the Serengeti, you know, surrounded by 20 people carrying their luggage. Um, granted, maybe not the best prophet, but Quentin Crisp, for those of you who are familiar with his work, who had a, a rapier-like tongue, pointed out that in England, you rarely don't have confusion at all about who you are because there's always someone there to yank you back in place, tell you exactly where you should be or where you shouldn't be. And I can appreciate that. So I got right off the bat that there is a relationship between oppressed communities and oppressors. And carrying that analogy, I guess, over to the conservation movement, uh, I think it's maybe a stretch for some people, but, but I'm hoping by the end of this conversation, you'll kind of see it at least some of that my way. 
um, pretty straight ahead definition of colonialism here. That's exactly what I'm talking about. People who lose their determinism by virtue of some greater force bearing down upon them. And you know, most conservation organizations have an agenda, have an issue. Very few of the big greens do much of anything at all that isn't funded. Actually, they're not necessarily humanitarian organizations. And the funding actually comes with an agenda as much as I've rarely found um, full-time staff environmentalists prepared to admit that. Money's not blind, it absolutely uh, funds you to do exactly what it wants. In other words, people with lots of money to give away, free money, typically care very much that their money not be used for purposes they don't approve of. And, and I've had this argument with other water keepers and with other uh, environmentalists. People will tell me, you know, I've, these guys have been funding me for years because I'm brilliant. Um, there's no way they tell me what to do. And, and my argument in reverse would be, that's why they're funding you is because they don't have to spell it out. They don't have to break it down, you know, into little bite-sized pieces. They understand that based on your history and who's on your board, that you're not of the sort that's going to make trouble for their brand. I see corporate money through foundations essentially exerting influence over people's ideas in the environmental community where we can't engage those folks because they're above the line, or at least above the line where we are. So... It has been confusing for me, after all these years of interacting with conservation movements, exactly who are we in these movements? We, people of color, do we matter? Are we a checkoff box? Are we diversity? Which is a framing that does offend me somewhat because the presumption that I'm defined before I've even walked in the room, that alone offends me. But the idea of diversity not being really a stakeholder, not being potential leadership, not being a font of ideas, Diversity is a little ambiguous in terms of the potential of what people of color could be in these movements. I do believe that most of the bigger greens would benefit greatly from having an infusion, large infusion of people of color. I think we have a, a, a different reality sometimes. And I believe that reality presents the world or these organizations with a 360 degree, closer to a 360 degree point of view. So I do believe these are deficient organizations to the extent they've tended to be mostly white. Um, which is a different point of view than most people have. I think most people think these are fundamentally good organizations that do good work. They just need some black folks. It's a little more complex with that because I don't think we're always talking about the same stuff, right? When we're talking about the environment, air, water, land, and things of that sort, our context for that is very different based on what we know and what we've experienced. In my case, I grew up on a family farm even when I wasn't living overseas. My father, who had come from the streets of Baltimore, Druid Hill Avenue, for those of you who know Baltimore, actually, and my mother, who was the farmer's daughter. So I had the country where we lived, and my father, as a, when we were teenagers, would send my sisters and I to Baltimore to experience what he had when he grew up, because he wanted us to have both frames. And it was in Baltimore in those days, too, that I realized that there was an environment there, too different kind of an environment, very different set of ground rules, very different competencies required to function out there in, in the world, right? When, when Baltimore cousins came to visit us in the country, they were alarmed at the lack of street lights, you know, like, holy cow, does Freddy Krueger live out here in the woods? How do you people, how do you people live out here where it's so dark, right? For them, light meant safety. For us, light meant we couldn't see the stars at night. Very, very different perspectives, but we're still talking about ostensibly the same thing, right? So it really does matter. <laughs> so in the course of water keeping, and if I haven't explained it, I didn't know that I necessarily need to, but maybe I should. So water keeper is an advocate. We work on, uh, we're a branded movement. We're licensed uh, by a licensing body. And there's one river keeper organization per watershed. And we're an international movement. There are about 350 water keepers all over the world. And we're all a little bit different. We are grassroots. We don't work for the parent organization. They simply license us. So as I got more invested in the water keeping work, I got deeply invested in the cases or problems of smaller communities, mostly because I could make eye contact, something I missed from my days in journalism, where we really weren't ourselves. I actually used to wear Hawaiian shirts and sunglasses on some of the close TV jobs. And I worked for an investigative unit for some years, mostly because I wanted to disassociate my true identity from the work I was doing that was so in your face, in some respects, rather unpleasant. People suffered because of it, right? We, we set people up to go to jail. We looked for, you know, felons. We, we were trying to make news. And so in a sense, we didn't really care about the people we were covering. They were commodities for us. I didn't want that kind of existence. I didn't want the communities we serve to be a commodity, 
right? And that tends to be true incidentally in the bigger greens, right? Where they have an issue like climate change or whatever, and they go into a community to get the community on their page and on their bandwagon. And I wanted to get on a community's bandwagon. So this is Joe Mills. Um, I could tell you a lot about Joe because he and I, it turns out, had a lot in common. His, his father took my mother to her senior prom. I never met this guy until I became a riverkeeper. He lived in my neighborhood and I'd never met this guy. He was on the football team when my sister Paula at Bowie State was the captain of the cheerleading squad. In her world, he didn't exist because she was popular and well-known, right? In his world, you're the brother of Paula Tuckman, right? We had all these things going on between us, but Joe had a one heck of a problem a housing developer literally stole his water supply that supplied his farm. The stream that ran through his property got diverted to make a stormwater management pond for a bunch of McMansions across the street. You can probably barely see it in the picture here, but way in the distance in the back, you can probably see the rooftops of these McMansions that went up there. Um, it meant that his place no longer had water. His cattle ranch literally lost its primary water supply. And once the stormwater management pond became operational, the water in his house dried up. And then the developer offered to buy his whole spread from him at a discount. This was one heck of an environmental justice case. When I got involved, Sierra Club was picketing on Route 50 near Washington to save the reptiles that were fleeing Joe's farm because there was no water there and were going across the road to where the water was unerringly, right? The, the reptiles, the animals knew exactly where the water was and started migrating towards it only to be mowed down by tractor trailers and trucks on, a, on, a, on an interstate highway. So Sierra Club was picketing to save the reptiles, but nobody was picketing to save Joe. And, you know, we got involved in his case and it taught me quite a lot about the uphill battle that we that, that, that people and communities face just trying to get basic decency. And, and if I left it out, I think I did inadvertently. The name of his farm was Oasis Farms. You really can't make this stuff up, right? I mean, the Oasis went dry. <laughs> And so did Joe, basically. Likewise, uh, we've been fighting the, the biggest coal burning power plant in the state of Maryland for close to 18 years, had, had, have had some victories and some successes. But right next door is the smallest municipality in the state of Maryland. Again, you can't make this up. The largest coal burning power plant is next to the smallest municipality. And it was the least empowered municipality in the state, um, a historically black community named Eagle Harbor. And we have done all kinds of collaborations with the town. And I should make clear we come with no agenda other than an environmental one to assist the town with whatever their goals are, right? The town told me, the town's mayor told me that he had never met an environmentalist before we came in the picture who didn't try and take something from the town, their voice, uh, donations, um, credibility, any number of things. It was the first time he had encountered environmentalists that actually brought resources and that offered to help. And we love this town. They love us and we love them because they're a fantastic place. And they're very much environmentalists. Interestingly enough, people who had overlooked this town, assuming that a town full of people of color wouldn't care so much about the environment or worse, was environmentally illiterate. That would be a mistake. These guys are very sharp and know exactly you know, what's up. Downriver in Calvert County, Maryland, and, and I, it's probably been made clear too, my river stays entirely in Maryland. So I don't, my work doesn't go anywhere except Maryland. <laughs> it goes upstream, it goes downstream, but it doesn't go to Virginia, it doesn't go to DC, it doesn't go to those other places. And this is an interesting one because this was a mobile home park sitting on the banks of the river that was flooding sewage into the river. It was owned by the richest guy in Southern Maryland who was actually having people work off some of their rent in this place uh, that he owned. Um, in order to uh, pay off their, you know, to pay their bills. And the key here, I think, is I was under a lot of pressure from the surrounding community to shut this operation down, which, of course, makes homeless people different problem, but an adjacent problem. You know, I, I try to focus this work to find genuine solutions to the problem, not the symptom. And the symptoms were obviously quite egregious here. We had kids going to school who couldn't bathe, couldn't shower, you know, who were bringing in bottled water. Eventually, we convinced the state to resituate these folks and to essentially buy the land. But that, that was an interesting dichotomy because this is a few hundred feet from that coal plant, right? So there's a huge pressure on me to shut these guys down and get rid of the coal plant. But the humanitarian issue of what you do about homeless people, one of those guys who owned the guy who owned this place said, look, um, just because they're called mobile homes doesn't mean they can go someplace. Some of them have wheels on them, and that doesn't mean they can go someplace. If you make me obey the law, if you regulate this, if you sue us, we'll shut this place down. You'll be responsible for making homeless people, and we'll flip this land into a higher density zoning and build McMansions and make a whole lot of money. 
I mean, this is who we're talking to, right? They talk about the, <laughs> not only an environmental justice problem, but a slumlord problem. In this instance, they were one and the same. And that's the point I'm trying to make. These are not just nature-based problems we deal with in these communities. They're bigger than that. They often have a connectivity to economic development and lots and lots and lots of other stuff. Corinne upstream, opposite into the watershed, up near Columbia, Maryland, um, on land that her parents left her where her parents are still buried. She showed me the headstones of her parents on this property. And she's terrified to go home at night because these guys in leather jackets from the Howard County Bureau of Utilities are demanding that she sign an easement to put a pipeline literally right through her front door basically condemn her house with the threat that if she doesn't sign the easement, they're going to use eminent domain and take it from her anyway. And by the way, they're offering her five bucks to take the money. Army Corps of Engineers, I got pretty mad about this one, had told her, take the money and don't get a lawyer. Because if you get legal representation, it usually makes those other people, the other side mad. And then they'll probably take away even the $5. I mean, I'm being facetious here, but I guess the idea is that there are deeper consequences <laughs> if you don't appease these guys instead of using your constitutional rights. That really shocked me. In the end, it was an economy move anyway. They didn't need to put the pipeline. There wasn't a public need. It was cheaper to run it in a straight line than to go around her house. That was really the only issue on the table. In the end, we convinced them to go around the house and, and, and Corinne kept her spot. But, but, but I, you know, I watched this unfold and I realized that even our government was complicit with these moving parties, these, these, these folks that have investment on the table and poor people or people of limited means or people of color, or in this case, a woman, is in the way. That's really what's going on here. They're in the way. Get them out of the way. Uh, Lothian, downriver. I'm almost out of the, 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 the weeds, but I wanted you to get the context for where some of my conclusions have come from. It's from deep embedded community-based eye contact work with these communities, helping them solve their problems side by side. Lothian sacrifice zone. Not only does it have five operating power uh, wastewater plants, all of them now being investigated by the EPA uh, for various exceedances and mishaps and other things that have gone wrong. But there's close to 20 other facilities where uh, mining facilities, reclamation facilities, dumping facilities, I've never seen in a five mile stretch of road, so many burdens is what you'll see in Lothian. And people are mad and they've had enough and they're, they're looking for a way to self-determine and to fight back. And I love being a part of those struggles. I really, I really do, because I think those have heart. These are really fantastic places that have never been given an opportunity to represent on their own behalf. So I've run into these implicit biases, these things that people seem to have rattling around in their head in the conservation movement. The idea that capitalism is really fundamentally good, that the template for starting a watershed organization is find the richest people you can in the watershed, put them on your board of directors, right? And then get everyone to join and send money. And yes, you do really nice work and good stuff, but fundamentally these are business enterprises that kind of copy corporate values. The idea is that they work for who funds them. They don't necessarily work for the communities touched by their policies, but they work for who gives them money, right? Which makes them, I think, a little bit suspect. Um, and I probably should have clarified too, we don't take or haven't been offered and probably won't be <laughs> foundation grants. We're largely funded by the communities themselves, by contracts that we get and by various other ways that don't really exploit the community's capital. We don't take their voice. We would never speak for a community or a town. We'll tell them to talk to the mayor or we'll put up a citizen who's authoritative to be the spokesperson. Our best work in this watershed is invisible. The whole point is that you don't see us, you see these communities that have essentially come into their own. The idea is commonplace that people of color don't really care about the environment. Like I said, this whole environmentally illiteracy, environmental illiteracy myth. Um, transactional green movements are really movements I think of that don't work big problems. They go narrowly to the thing they're interested in. If it's climate change, they're working on that. If it's stormwater, it's on that. But they don't have funding for all that other stuff. And so they need to be very, very narrow. They have a tendency to trivialize the community's goals into issues. You know, problems and issues are not the same thing. Now, issues are trite explanations of something that might be funded. So you can lump all those things in the same box. Is this a stormwater thing or a climate change thing? Right? Problems are very specific and very specific to the community. The idea that career professionals get to be the boss of these campaigns bothers me too, because I do believe that, that leadership needs to be cultivated. Leadership needs to grow from the ground up. And you cultivate leadership, not by keeping it at the top, you know, like a profession, like lawyers and doctors. Activism isn't that. It's paying it forward. It's getting communities not only to own their own problems and their own solutions, 
but building leadership from within. And that doesn't really happen with the bigger greens, right? They're in charge. They've got to run the issue because they've got to deliver the deliverables that are in that uh, grant of funds. And so they don't have that flexibility, which is why I don't think it's as simple as just recruiting someone to change the game inside these organizations. Their very business model depends on them controlling and branding the issues. That's where you get the brands that come up related to climate change, like cool cities or beyond coal, or you know, I could rattle off a bunch of others. The idea that global causes are better and more important than local ones is shocking to small towns and communities that need all kinds of stuff but have to take a number to get behind some global issue that granted, while it might be an existential threat, these guys are existentially threatened every day. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not laughing to marginalize it. I'm laughing because of the irony that local communities should abandon their own needs and put them aside. Let me tell you another quick story before I forget. I know I'm interrupting myself here. I went to a, a storm, a, a planning board meeting in Prince George's County where the environmentalists who happened to be mostly white were arguing for better stormwater standards on the, the, the building project. The mayor of the town got up and said, I don't care about clean water. I care, that's what the white folks want. And the whole room just kind of went, oh, did she just say that out loud? You know, I talked with her afterwards and what she was saying was actually a little more specific, that nobody from the environmental community had called her and talked to her about this issue, that they really needed jobs in the community. And yes, they'd love to have a Walmart with really good environmental standards as an oxymoron as that might sound. <laughs> Uh, but nobody was offering. And so what she really wanted was the opportunity to have her own say in her own community and not have all these uh, professional environmentalists with all their science and exhibits and all that stuff, literally overwhelming the ability for the community to have a voice at all. Like I said, nobody in the room had talked to her except us to find out what she really meant. Everyone else assumed, well, she's ignorant. <laughs> right? So uh, these are the kind of boxes we find ourselves in. So Colonized thinking and, and, and the idea is that we have to recapture the vocabulary and the values and examine what's under the hood in these movements to decide if they really have the gravitas to save the planet or anything else. But more importantly, what's their vision? What are those values? And who's paying the freight? Where's that money really coming from? Some of you might have heard of the Powell Memoranda. Uh, and the Powell Memoranda, written by a former Supreme Court justice, was written for the US Chamber of Commerce back in the 70s. And its point was a template for corporate America co-opting dissent causes, particularly environmental causes are actually named. The idea is the way you keep these organizations within the box from reaching their full potential is you fund them and then you have a voice in them. And this is real. And, and I think uh, there's probably a link uh, that's be on your uh, chat or somewhere. And you can actually go look up the Powell Memorandum and read it, it's scathing. It's fascinating that what we're talking about here isn't just philanthropy 101. It's literally a scheme, a plan came up with that was come up with quite, quite a number of years ago to make sure these environmental organizations don't really clean up the planet, that they do feel good stuff, that they talk to you about your stewardship, not corporations about their stewardship. They wanna to talk to you about your rain barrels and about your rain gardens and your recycling, all of which is good stuff, none of which is proportional to solving anybody's problem, right? These are stopgap measures. They tend not to be uh, a template for a big picture scheme for preserving the planet or the race. These are not pragmatic <laughs> folks who fund this stuff. They're looking at the bottom line for the next fiscal year. Insider movements bother the heck out of me is because the benefits flow mostly to the people in charge or up top. And so I will not be a part of a coalition that is largely comprised of insider movements, whether those insiders are black or white or whatever. I don't like insider movements because I don't believe those are fair or equitable movements because the insiders basically have all the have all the all the stuff. All right. We're getting down to it. So I know we're getting short on time. Um, I just want to point out here's a totally incoherent statement about diversity and equity and inclusion from a major funder in my area. Um, as a network, we've made equity in the environmental grant making a priority and will explore and implement strategies necessary to move members individually and collectively along a journey to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice. What, what do these guys do exactly? You read this and you think, well, oh, this is lip service. It has to be because it's not very specific. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, uh, we do diversity. Um, likewise, here's a group on the left, circled in red. We're advocates for a healthy environment, but we don't litigate or lobby. Well, good are you? In other words, what's the juice that backs up what you're asking for? I think what they're saying is we ask all the time to get the environment cleaned up, 
And if people don't do it, we move on. We ask somebody else. <laughs> I think, and I'm not sure. Uh, and hopefully you don't think I'm mean for picking on these guys, but I do want to highlight, want to contrast how this rhetoric really plays out. My friend Howard Ertz, uh, who's written several books, this is one of them about the Bay Movement, points out that there's a spectrum. The dark greens, which mostly will be found, frankly, in BIPOC communities, because we know we've never gotten anything by asking nicely. We've had to activate, organize, <laughs> and get it together, right? The mere idea that we're going to write our senator or our congressman and they're going to magically fix our problem is something that belongs to, frankly, insiders, of which we are not insiders. Um, the lighter greens are the folks who indeed write the petitions and the sign-on letters and do all this very soft stuff, and they ask nicely, uh, and they never, never litigate, because that's, like, really, really rude and just gets people upset. And most importantly, scares away the money. People have actually said that to me. You know, you guys are the ones who scare away the money. So, uh, so I get the, the, the ruse, the game, is that you're supposed to take what money they throw you, whatever alms, and let the planet go to heck along the way. Uh, Environmental Grant Makers Association, I went as an invited speaker. After tonight, I won't be invited back. There was a guy there with a gun guarding a giant flip chart. It explains what everybody here funds, but they have it guarded because they don't want anybody to take a picture of it and take it home. Think about that for a minute. The thing at the bottom of the list, the thing that almost nobody in this organization funds, at least at that time, this was about four years ago, was advocacy. <laughs> they don't fund advocacy, they fund building funds, they fund um, uh, capacity growing campaigns, a whole list of stuff they fund. Advocacy isn't one of them. They'll, they'll basically fund anything except the stuff that changes something. Right? These are very conservative organizations and that they don't want too much change and they only want the sort of change they want. Nowadays, where the money comes from is very hard to tell sometimes. The money goes into a common fund like this one I just picked at random. Goodness knows who put money into this fund because ultimately it gets washed by virtue of going into this common pool and then parsed out. So I don't know if I really have time to get deeply into this, but I did want to point out some other stuff that I saw and just in my work in Maryland. I, I, we got together with the University of Maryland and we started pulling state records to find out where all the environmental restoration money was going. Uh, this one looks at home ownership and the darkest areas, I'll kind of cut to the chase for you, are basically where people mostly own their homes and the biggest dots are where most of the money goes. And you can see for the most part, there are a few exceptions. Uh, the money goes to where people own their homes. Right, there's an inherent bias. Here's another chart from the same study. You can, you can get this study, and I think I put the link um, out there, so you probably have that as well. Um, this is about poverty. Um, in this case, the darkest areas are essentially where the most poverty can be found, right? And the biggest dots is where most of the money goes, and there's almost no big dots where poverty areas exist. So where people are poor, you don't see much improvement in the environmental conditions because your tax money isn't being spent to do that. Uh, here you've got uh, median household income. Um, big dots mean big money. Dark areas mean, you know, saturated uh, dark areas mean um, with the high incomes are the highest. You see, there are a few exceptions, but more likely as not, if you have a high income, you're going to get yourself a restoration project. The state's very interested in spending money to do something about your environmental problems. So I wrote all this stuff up, or in a general way, published it in an article, sent it out, and ended up getting syndicated around the country, mostly because I thought I don't have the answer. <laughs> God knows, maybe I'll find some people out there who want to have this conversation. First thing that happened was two board members of mine quit. They didn't want anything part of an idea where we're going to start taking a different look, a decolonization look that was reclaim the intellectual airspace around these issues to find out what's real. Um, the other thing that happened that was fascinating was five people of color with fantastic credentials called me the next day and said, I read that article. How do I get on your board? And so we have a dream team board of, 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 of people of color, uh, actually many interest groups represented. And even that's not easy because it's true. Everyone comes to the table with their own perspective. And so we have people there who are kind of the, you know, I won't say garden variety, but, you know, your typical Isaac Walton, Sierra Club type of people who are sometimes a little challenged by some of the more radical stuff that comes up in our board meetings. But we love, all of us, I think, the idea that this is a richer, better organization by virtue of the fact that it has a lot more inclusion than we ever had before. Free range environmentalism also drives me nuts. These people who think they can go anywhere and start telling people what to do environmentally. Um, in a black community, in a white community, except I don't know any black environmentalists who can do this in a white community. There is a sense of domain that seems to go with these movements that they can boss people around, even where they're not competent to do so. So turf is where you belong and domain is where you can go. 
And, and because of lack of time, I won't delve too, too more deeply, much more deeply into that other than to say, um, take a look at where you can go <laughs> versus where you belong. And you will probably see some kind of a disparity. And that's very, very commonplace. Um, Revolution Not Be Funded, important link to get in, check this out. This book changed my life because it articulated for me essentially these things, and which I have always found to be true. The corporate money, how it, whichever guise it arrives on your plate, does have a tendency to kind of re-engineer what you're prepared to fight about, work on, and do, and rather coercively begins <laughs> to change the agenda of the organization. The folks who don't have a problem with this are exactly the folks who raised the biggest funds from foundations. So let me tie it up because I don't, I wanna make sure we have, I guess we have a little bit more time to, because I kind of got, a, got ahead of myself. Oh, and amongst the 17 environmental uh, commonly accepted, you can find them, I believe we put a link in there as well. This one is the one that the bigger greens almost always have a problem with. They always wanna edit this one. The idea of affirming people's fundamental right <laughs> to self-determine ought to be a no brainer. And yet they constantly interfere with these communities attempts, at least on environmental matters. And remember, because they're fairly narrow at what they look at, they're only looking at the environmental errors. They're not looking at the economic development. They're not looking at the history and the culture and all that other stuff. In fact, they don't even have the time to get into that stuff because they are, after all, professionals. And so, and I'm not making the argument these rooms are all bad, 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 bad. What I'm trying to say is we need to use some discernment on where these organizations are really good. They do some things rather well. I can lobby the hell out of Congress, <laughs> right? What they do on a local level, not so good. For the most part, they, they, they never seem to get it right because their business model doesn't really lend itself to that. So I'm not gonna sit here and try and argue, oh, well, we should need to get rid of all of these, uh, these uh, uh, big greens. That would be absurd. <laughs> what I'm really saying is that we're not nearly as discerning as we should be because quite frankly, we're working at cross purposes sometimes. When it comes to this diversity and inclusion and Jedi and whatever all these acronyms that people wanna use, I will say, um, I don't really care if these organizations diversify or not. I, I just want them to come clean. If they're not gonna do it, I'm not gonna waste my time helping them do it. I might still come to their parties on those beach fronts and those bonfires and other stuff, but. Uh, they have to roll the voice back. You don't get to be the leading voice for water if you only talk to the white people in your watershed or the black people for that matter. That doesn't earn you that right. I've been to plenty of meetings in my home state where we're meeting with the governor or with the um, attorney general and somebody gets up and says, sir, all the leading environmentalists are right here willing and able to hear what you have to say. And I'm thinking, I'm looking around to see who we're leading. These movements need us more than we need them and we need to make clear that if they're not inclusive, they're incomplete. They don't really get to speak for everybody, right? So really small clubs with rather relatively small <laughs> representation have a very different voice than some that actually have the hearts and minds of a vast, uh, fantastic constituency of which I think people of color represent. And I've been told this by Asian Americans, by African Americans, by people from, um, you know, uh, who come from Latin American cultures. This is true. If the presumption is that you are normal in these organizations, if you're white, that's racist because it's not animus, but it's a presumption. The expectation that everyone in charge is white is in itself racist and classist potentially too, I guess. But you, you see the point that I'm making. These movements are incomplete movements. If they wanna stay that way, let them. <laughs> if they really wanna open themselves up to all the great things that come with a mass of people of color who have been boycotting these organizations for decades, <laughs> who aren't really interested in what they're talking about, who really want you on as much some recipro reciprocity, right? Not just getting you us on your bandwagon, but having room on that bandwagon for some of our issues as well. That's what I found as a community activist. I'll end on this last slide. This came from Teaching Nature Black, one of the conferences we've helped organize um, along with Audubon Naturalist Society. Um, fantastic party of people of color environmentalists from many walks. And we did a decolonization workshop and we did a word map. And, and these are the word maps that came up. If you were to colonize toxic environmental organization, you have science obsessed, silence, underserved, racism, supremacy, manipulative, dispossessed, victim, passive aggressive. On the positive side, not so colonized organizations, fairness, art, self-definition, soulful, anti-racist, reclaiming our voices, telling our story. You, you get the picture. It's obvious what's going on here, that it's a boycott. And it's obvious that the decolonization means restarting the conversation exactly where we all are. 
as opposed to assuming that the people already in these clubs, many of whom happen to be white and guided largely by wealth, <laughs> that they're the ones who get to tell us where the conversation actually starts. So I think I should stop there. I probably had a couple more frames. You know, I always, uh, let me see which ones I didn't get it. Yeah, we're there. We're at the end. I just want to show activist people because I love activism. I love people who want to make it clear that they want to change things, that there's enough, enough broken in this world that we need to get busy changing stuff. And the guys who pretend it's really just about recycling and, you know, all that stuff. Well, <laughs> that's a different crowd, different movement. So there it is. I appreciate your, your time and attention. I think I did run over a bit. And um, there we go. I'd love to hear your questions and uh, your observations. Um, why don't I go to some of the questions? And if there's time, I'll tell a couple of stories myself. So um, let's see. Um, Thoughts about the abolitionist approach. Um, and that's an article in The Guardian about once men abused slaves, now we abuse fossil fuels. Pointing out the similarities and differences between slavery and the use of fossil fuels can help us engage with climate change in a new way. Uh, based on that terribly little information about the article. Does that ring any bells for you? Only that I'm always a little leery when we start using something else to talk about a thing. Most of things are what they are, you know, A equals A. As much as I think what we're grasping for here is a good analogy to help people get it. So there's a, there's a, there's a corollary to that, and I saw that very recently. And that corollary, I think, is the more complex we make it for people to understand these things, the more likely only the people at the top, the insiders, will get it. That we have to break the language down and these ideas down to a, not dumb them down, I'm not saying that at all, but make them much more accessible, actually. And I was actually at a meeting this week where like, we were all into the weeds of climate change stuff and all these acronyms, and I pointed out that it was inaccessible to regular folks. And then someone raised their hand and said, maybe we can get a grant to explain it to them. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that's true. That really happened. <laughs> so I have a question here from one of our um, supporters uh, named Ralph Baker. And he says, we at the Nashua River Watershed Association love to get folks out on the river. How might we be more welcoming? We've done that, too. We actually ran an ESOL. English as a second language program um, back in 2005, because we had a person on staff who was multilingual. And we put out an ad that said, learn to paddle and learn English at the same time. <laughs> and we got a lot of turnout for that. Um, it was never funded. We do a lot of stuff that's not funded, it turns out. I shouldn't admit that publicly, but it's true, because it was a lot of fun. We got to have a good time on the river. We met some interesting people. And we got connected to people who were experiencing a new thing for the first time. I wonder if it would have been the same if we said, learn to parachute. <laughs> I just wonder, but that's one way. I mean, I think what you're doing is great. We, we're all about connecting people. We take kids and teach them how to fish and you know, we get people in nature. We happen to run a facility that doesn't have um, you know, a lot of rules and restrictions other than the obvious ones, don't hurt anybody. And so I think that people from many walks feel very welcome there. There's not a lot of red tape, I guess what I'm really saying, and a lot of watchfulness. I guess I should admit that publicly too, but do you know what I'm saying? You, if you're accessibly accessible, there's a huge fight. I know we're short on time, but going on right now where I live and work over the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the fact that they have a private beach. <laughs> this is the largest and leading conservation organization in the region operating from a beach you need a key card in order to get on. And people are clamoring for public access to the Chesapeake Bay. And these guys have all these science-based rationales for why that's not really politic to, to have that on their site. But I guess what I'm saying is symbolically, I like to think that the kind of organization I'd want to join would be the one that is accessible on any level, kayaking, fishing, whatever it is that I, I want to do. The one I'm a little leery of is the one that actually has some rules because they're intentionally being exclusive either because they think it's good for business or good, you know, policy or good science, but it's still the same. So there it is. I don't know if that was a direct answer to your question, other than I love to kayak too. Uh, haven't done much I, of it I yet. think that was a great answer to the question. Uh, it's, it's the basic answer to the question 
on many levels. Um, how can you be more welcoming? Well, just welcome people. Yeah, say hi. <laughs> I have chased white folks down the road. I'm admitting this. Why are you leaving early? Well, we didn't think we'd be welcome. And that's a phenomenon too. <laughs> Right? Why people who look at me at a party at our office and ask, is it okay for us to dance too? I'm not kidding. This is part of what we have to work out, we human beings with each other. My goodness. Right? You come yeah. to a party and you have to ask for permission to dance because you don't want to dance, you know, you don't want to be shown up by the. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to read too much into it, but you see what I'm talking about. We have to work harder to understand each other. We're stuck with each other. <laughs> uh, that is a profound truth. We are stuck with each other. Um, what role does ritual play, if any, in this topic, especially if you don't come from any particular environmental traditions? That's a great question, and we have struggled with this too. So we have a, a medicine woman in one of the indigenous disciplines who's been watching our office during the COVID and all stuff just to provide a presence on site since we're not working, they're working. Enough. And even before COVID, she was running events and ceremony. In fact, she's very much invested and she uses that word, ceremony. We need more ceremony. And initially I went to these, there was one ceremony where there was fruit tossed into the river at the end of it as an offering. And I remember thinking kind of, oh, do you need a permit for that? <laughs> I mean, fruit's pretty benign. I, you know, I don't think that's, that's a problem. But I will say that the absence of ceremony is something that people have told me that they stay away from, from these broader, bigger movements. That they don't, because they get together and talk about science, ceremony, symbolism, um, you know, Day of the Dead, uh, reverence, those are things that are happen in different spaces. And I personally have learned quite a lot from going to these ceremonies because I generally feel reverent in nature anyhow. This, this fits me very well. So. It's kind of hard not to feel reverence in nature when, when you pay attention, but it'll be different for different people. Absolutely. That's the thing. And that's what I forgot to mention. So we have a little pushback occasionally. People think, well, I'm Catholic. I don't know if I should participate in this. You know, I can't help people with that. <laughs> I, I think you go and you do, you follow the customs of where you are. And I don't think that means you abdicated your Catholicism because you participated in a Native American ceremony where fruit was thrown into the river. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a question worth asking, let me put it that way, but it's not one I could really answer. I'm yeah. pretty flexible in that respect myself. A person who actually help, helped us with our Miyawaki forest, uh, he's um, a biologist <clears throat> and he, he grows, uh, he has a nursery um, and he says, hi Fred, great talk. I am curious to know what you think of the Potomac Watershed's Growing Native Initiative. It seems to me it is worthy of emulation in other regions. Volunteers of all ages and backgrounds participate in growing native and by collecting acorns and other native tree seeds across the region. Not only are participants creating forests for tomorrow, they are also learning the important connection between healthy forested lands and clean water. Since growing native's inception in 2001, nearly 56,000 volunteers have collected more than 164,000 pounds of acorns, walnuts, and other hardwood tree and shrub seeds. These seeds have been used to grow seedlings that are planted to restore sensitive stream side forests. In addition to providing native trees for stream restoration, growing native builds public awareness of the important connection between healthy forested lands and clean water and what individuals can do to help our local environment. So what are your thoughts of the Growing Native Initiative? What a slick way to get a public service announcement on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love it. I mean, I, I, I hope you didn't think that Robert Benchley was my only hero. Um, I, actually, Johnny Appleseed was too, John Chapman. He was a hell of a guy too. He was pragmatic enough to understand that you plant seeds. And there's lots of ways we can spin that analogy because we do think that's what we're doing at Patuxent Riverkeeper. We're planting yeah. seeds of activism that will outlive us because goodness knows we don't live forever. And so I think Growing Native is a fantastic project. And it's, you know, <laughs> what can I say? It's so obviously beneficial, great, wonderful. Um, I don't know how to pitch it to folks who don't have that context, right? Like going out and planting all this stuff and doing all that stuff. That's, that's culturally kind of like, I don't know. It depends. I think it all depends. It's not for everyone, but nothing is. <laughs> so more power to you. 
Yeah. Great. So you've kind of answered this next question, but perhaps you have something more to say. Do you feel many of the NGOs won't support black communities? Do you feel they won't support climate injustice, for example? I think that these are groups that are struggling, struggling with how to be competent in places where they've barely looked in some cases. I don't want to typify, you know, everyone's in a different space. Some that I've encountered have no idea what's going on in black communities. And so they're not really culturally competent. I think they understand that in some cases, and that's why they've hired people of color to do that. The one that gets under my skin sometimes is the urban outreach coordinator. They have this title on a business card on a couple of the conservation. You know, urban to me is code for like, oh, that's who talks to the people of color, which can be patronizing, you know, and, and has echoes from my old career. I once called the BBC assignment desk looking for freelance work. And she said, oh, Fred Tubman, you're our favorite Negro stringer. This was like 40 years ago, right? It's like, oh, but we don't have Negro stories this week, but give me a call in a week or something, and we'll give you a call when you don't have a Negro story. So I, I hate the idea of people who are facially kind of put out there as a front to buffer the organization's connection to a black and brown community. That's a little sticky, I think. I think yeah. we have to invest ourselves in these communities which I know is hard for big greens to do. I'm not trying to pick on these guys just because I'm going to pick on them. I'm saying there's things they do well and the things they don't do nearly as well. The big greens can't afford to invest themselves and make eye contact in these communities. That's why we've got to build better movements from the ground up, right? If these guys are always the professionals and always in charge and keep all the money and uh, that's not a model for saving the planet. That's something else. That's a business. Actually, it's a capitalist business model is what it is. I mean, let's face it, it's drawn from capitalism because that's what funds us. I don't know how to change that either. I need money as much as anyone, but I do have some discernment about when I'm making a living versus when I'm making a difference. I'm saying well, we need to get better at that. <laughs> it's, it sounds like that was a lifelong evolution for you to develop up until now. that discernment. <laughs> right. And it's, it's not at all obvious. Mm -hmm. And uh, Biodiversity for a Livable Climate as an organization has struggled for um, all of our existence with, with respect to understanding these things that are not obvious. Mm -hmm. If you're, I guess, if you're white or yeah. if you're privileged, mm -hmm. it's just very, very different. Um, mm -hmm. Well, the and, it, and it's a, it's a struggle. Yes, exactly. struggle. It's a struggle to get there, yeah. and uh, we have, uh, yeah, we've we've worked really hard at it. So I look, and for we have a long way to go. I always look for evidence of struggle. If I really want to know what the heck these guys are doing to change the world, I'm looking for some struggle. If I see they're making nine to five and making you know six figure salaries, <laughs> I don't see nearly as much struggle. Which is not to say they're no good, you know, lousy bums. It just means I get clear what they're doing and what they're not doing. That's what I'm really trying to say. I know that it hasn't always come across that way. So sometimes people think, oh, Fred's the bomb thrower. You know, he's idealistic. He hates money. None of that. <laughs> I'm just saying discernment. So, Yeah. Well, sometimes discernment looks like throwing a bomb, depending <laughs> upon who you are. Uh, I think we need less bombs. Uh, absolutely. Personally. <laughs> yeah. But in, in this respect... Yeah. Uh, the bomb is not just what somebody throws, but it's a perception Absolutely. on the part of the other person. So we have one question here about our growth culture continually buries your efforts and all of our environmental problems. What are your views on this? Well, yeah, the idea of unlimited growth is pretty unviable. If ever, if ever there was an unsustainable concept, <laughs> that. Um, I don't know what to do with this growth. I mean, we could pick, we could cherry pick and people could talk about, you know, birth control and stuff, but Mars isn't a solution either. <laughs> that's the one that really gets me. It's like, we're going to blow this planet up, but we think that's a better idea. Have you seen what's up there? It's not very I, 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 <laughs> I think it's a good idea for Elon Musk and... Yeah, and, yeah, for rich guys, which says yeah. something, right? It's a playground right. for the rich right now, or a profit center, potentially. I think that's where they're going to, is they want to be the first to make money in space or to monopolize it, just like the Wright brothers, people forget, wanted to own flight. They didn't make any friends uh -huh. for that. <laughs> they wanted to patent flight. So everybody who came up with a better idea would still have to pay them a royalty. 
So yeah, we have to look past that. Did you see that, uh, what's his name, um, Bezos, when he came back, mm-hmm. he said we should put our most polluting industries in space. And I thought, oh, we're going to pollute space now? Is that the ethic we want to carry to the stars? We're here with our pollution. Take me to your pollution. <laughs> aside, aside from that, uh, going to space is extremely expensive and mm-hmm. is only available to the people who are in other parts of uh, the Chesapeake Bay. Yes. Have you caught it's so expensive, our government can't afford it. That's why we're outsourcing the space program. I'm not kidding. That's why those guys are doing it. They're carrying our satellites into space for us. We don't have a space program anymore. We, we subcontract that. It's too expensive. Wow. Uh, right. And, and it's so expensive that only the people who aren't taxed fairly can afford to do it. So there you go. So we got to make something of what we have here, folks. We've lost all these species. We, <laughs> there's so much we'll never get back. But there's what's left, all of it's worth saving, as much of it as we can possibly salvage. All of it, not just the brown field, not just the green fields. Ground the brown fields. fields. The brown fields too. Yeah, all of it. All of it. And uh, one of the things that is part of Bio for Climate's message is that there's 50% of the land on this planet that is bare ground and re-radiating sunlight as heat. Mm-hmm. Whereas when sunlight hits green plants, it's not re-radiated as heat. It's used up in building biomass and in evaporating, transpiring water to cool the, the biosphere. Mm-hmm. And um, we really need to take care of every square inch that we possibly can. Mm -hmm. I agree. So if I didn't make clear before, I am so grateful to do this work. I was dying where I was. I mean, it was fun at first, but after 20 some years, it got really flat and I felt I was running out of ways to justify doing it further, but didn't know how to make a living. Who knew that you could become a keeper and help people and really change people's lives sometimes. You know, other days we're doing really mundane stuff. We're, we're office keepers. We're not just river keepers. But, but you understand that this is a, an opportunity I feel very fortunate to have had. And I wish more people would invest themselves in this type of work. And we need more river keepers of all colors, <laughs> of all ethnicities, of all cultures. And the water keeper movement is an international movement, but we're struggling too to, to yeah. reconcile these different cultures, different senses of humor. It's complex. That's humanity. Yeah, yeah, that's that's who we are, and that's fine. But destroying our life support system is not so fine. So I think we're just about at the end of our time. And so uh, I would like to thank you so much, Fred, for for joining us. 